In the Stakes miniseries, Marceline experienced an existential crisis about her own immortality and had to slay vampires from her past. Vampires that were heavily inspired by tarot cards. The tarot originated in Europe as a pack of cards to play games with. It was not until the 18th century that tarot reading emerged as a form of cardomancy, which is the use of cards to divine the unknown or the future. This occult association is what survives into the popular culture of today. When people think of tarot, they generally think of divination and fortune-telling. Now, I obviously don't believe tarot cards can read someone's future. The death card? No, that's good. It means transition. Change. Oh. <gasps> A happy squirrel. That's bad? Possibly. The cards are vague and mysterious. However, the predictive aspect aside, I do think tarot cards can potentially serve as an interesting tool to aid in contemplation on the present. Tarot cards have been injected with cultural meaning so that each card represents a range of vague concepts, and reading tarot cards can simply equate to asking if and how those concepts might apply toward your own life. It can serve as a wacky little framework for self-reflection and thoughtful meditation. The random cards you happen to draw merely act as bouncing off points to critically examine your recent actions, thoughts, feelings, circumstances, etc. Now, all this can obviously be applied when it comes to analyzing characters in a work of fiction, especially so when those characters happen to be directly based on the tarot. The Major Arcana were an obvious source of inspiration for the vampires of the Stakes miniseries, and thus the vampires possess traits and thematic elements associated with the respective card they represent, and in most cases were even named after. In this video, I will be pointing out these aspects and dissecting them, but I'll be going even further than that, because Stakes was not just about hunting vampires. It was about Marceline's personal journey of dealing with her immortal existence and finding the strength to keep going. Those whom Marceline fights against represent characteristics and elements in her own life, and this makes the Stakes miniseries a very holistic experience. The tarot apply toward Marceline just as much as they do to the vampires. So the format I will follow from here on out will be to first describe the ways in which a vampire is based on their respective card, and then analyze how that arcanum applies to Marceline. So let's get going! Let's discuss the Stakes miniseries via the framework of tarot. It all has to start with a fool. Smell my feet, Marceline! I promise you won't regret it. As a fun visual note, in the oldest tarot decks, the fool was often depicted as a beggar or vagabond, and would often be barefoot, as is the case with the vampire fool. I doubt this is merely a coincidence, plus the vagabond nature is also sort of alluded to. He's squatting in a van when Marceline first kills him in the past, and after being resurrected, makes this suggestion for a new dwelling. Mm, what if we just got a loft downtown? In Stakes, the fool is literally a fool. He's kind of a simpleton. That's not exactly what the card represents, although embracing folly can be a part of it. The fool card is associated with spontaneity, being uninhibited, acting on impulse, living in the moment, doing the unexpected, being childlike, and all of those things most certainly apply to this dude. Hey, you wanna see something funny? <laughs> I look like a butt. <laughs> Being unbound by restrictions also symbolically ties in with his ability being that of flight, which generally represents freedom. Letting go of worries and fear can lead one into danger, however, and thus in tarot readings, the fool needs to stay grounded, so to say, to avoid potential harm. The fool in stakes is most definitely not grounded, and his carefree attitude and naivete is what gets him killed by Marceline, who he doesn't register as a potential threat. A lack of understanding can be quite dangerous. Your loss. <laughs> the Fool Arcanum is most well known for representing the start of something new, entering a new phase, the beginning of a journey or adventure. As such, it only makes sense for the Fool to be the very first vampire that Marceline eliminates and absorbs the essence of. It's the start of Marceline becoming an eternal, tormented teen. I should also mention, the Fool was the only vampire willing to stay by the Vampire King's side after his declaration to start a new era. Indeed. Hey, 
Martha Lee! Look at me! I'm all grown up now! I ate a chicken, Martha Lee! So the fool denoting the start of a new journey is very well represented in stakes, and potentially even outside the miniseries. So check this out. Certain designs of the Fool card often feature a dog companion, and I simply can't help but think of Schwabble being by young Marceline's side. In fact, we first see Schwabble in the scene right after Marceline absorbs the Fool's essence and figuratively takes on that persona herself. Now the first time we ever saw Schwabble in Adventure Time was in the episode It Came From The Nightosphere, which is the episode that began to explore Marceline's character on a deeper level and kickstarted her eventual reconciliation with her father. That works really well retroactively. And the last time we see Schwabble is in the series finale, when Marceline's life has entered a new phase due to Simon's return and her relationship with Princess Bubblegum blossoming. That also fits so well into a tarot-based reading. I'm kind of blown away by it. It's a relatively minor detail that I think is really cool when you expand on it. Marceline's relation to the Fool card doesn't stop at the start of a new journey. Tarot cards can be in an upright position or reversed, and a reversed card takes on a new set of potential meanings and interpretations. Marceline's state of mind at the start of stakes reflects the reversed Fool card, which can be associated with stagnation, with feeling like you're stuck in place, with difficulty seeing the world with fresh eyes. Back in the episode Marceline's Closet, she sang about her struggle with an immortal vampiric existence. My vampire eyes see only blood red skies. Blood red skies make tears inside that I always have. And by the time Stakes starts, Marceline is ready to give up being a vampire for good because she feels her life has no meaning in its current form. I don't want to spend eternity like this, with this emptiness. I want to grow up. That's a solid representation of the reversed Fool card that kicks off yet another journey, a journey of personal growth for Marcy. As an amusing side note, Marceline wants to change so bad that she's willing to embrace death. This means someday you'll die. You know that, right? Ooh, I guess that'll be my last adventure. And everyone knows in tarot, the death card represents change. I just thought that was a fun little detail. Alright, let's now move on to the Empress. Sell your spirit to the skies. Surrender to the Empress Eyes. On first glance, it may seem the Empress has little in relation to her respective major Arcanum, but there's actually plenty of overlaps to be found, especially when you consider this vampire as a sort of corruption or perversion of what the Empress card usually represents. While there's no overt ties to nature, save for the snake that rests wrapped around her neck, the Empress Arcanum, as a symbol of beauty and femininity, plays quite a large role. Ice King being wooed by thinking there's a woman who is finally into him takes up a large portion of the episode, and many allusions were made to the past when Simon was being hypnotized to serve the Empress as his mistress. He used to have more of a silver fox thing going on with his hair and those cute glasses. He was happier then, you know, when he was serving me. <coughs> Dang, girl! The hypnosis power itself plays into how the Empress card in a negative reading can represent an overbearing and smothering quality. Her ability is a corruption of the lasting love and loyalty traits typically associated with the Empress Arcanum. Her hypnosis creates forced loyalty and coerced love. Likewise, the motherhood and fertility aspects of the card are applied in a twisted manner. The Empress wants to figuratively birth a massive vampire colony, where an army of minions expand her reign and serve her every whim. We must start rebuilding our realm. There's life here, and I bet it's pathetic. We march in, we take control, and we rebuild the hive. If you're gonna caterwaul like this, then I may as well start building my army. Master luego, turds. The Empress card can also signify abundance and luxury, which that reading is actually really straightforward for this vamp, but simply taken to an unhealthy extreme. Where are the comforts of the old hive? The minions, the blood, the good blood with the gold leaf flaked into it. 
She's all about the physical and sensual pleasures of life. She desires to relish in the material delights of the physical world. <sighs> Tastes like cheese water. Where's the top drawer stuff? The reversed Empress card can represent an unhealthy over-reliance on other people, and this is exactly what brought the Empress to her demise. She is struck down in part because her hypnosis power fails to work on Ice King. The Empress is too reliant on having other people fight her battles. <sighs> Marceline Abadir's relation to the Empress card mostly revolves around the caregiving, nurturing, and protective aspects. When Marcy was still little, Simon was the one who cared for her and provided those things, and around the time Stakes takes place, Marcy is the one who occasionally checks in on Simon and looks after him. Marceline saved Simon from the Empress once before in the past, and during the events of Stakes, she once again prioritizes Simon's safety above all else. Surprised you have the time to play around while the Empress makes her way to the land of ice and snow. Simon! Crud! <sighs> Marceline even gives up a surefire stealth staking of the Empress so that she can check Ice King's condition. Simon! Marceline! What has she done to you? Did she bite you? Marceline's protective nature extended far beyond just her love for Simon. During her teenage years, Marcy's affection towards Simon paved the way for her role as a guardian for all humankind. I think Marceline channeled her love for Simon into protecting humanity from vampires because, in a sense, she felt like she had failed to protect Simon's humanity from the influence of the crown. Staking vampires, protecting the last remaining humans, it felt like I was protecting you. The humans may have very well gone extinct without Marceline's help. Two Bread Tom and crew would have never made it to Founders Island where humankind could flourish if not for Marceline's constant aid back on the mainland. Life is more than mere survival, and we just might live the good life yet. A reversed Empress card can signify neglect, and this is what the Empress tries to guilt Marceline with. She implies that Simon's decline, his transformation into the Ice King, could have been prevented if Marceline had cared for him more and put in more effort. If you really cared about him, why'd you let him degenerate into this pathetic clown character? At the base level, this is a false and dishonest accusation, but there's a tragic grain of truth to it. Ice King, through his gradual exposure and involvement, and eventually even friendship with others, was able to become semi-reformed toward the end of Adventure Time. You can't make Simon start kidnapping princesses again? Yeah, he's semi-reformed! If Marceline had not lost track of her moral code and tried to stay more in touch with him, like she does later in the series, could Ice King have grown into a better person many years earlier? What are you doing here? I told you not to come around me! My loaded question is meant to be largely rhetorical. There's obviously not a straightforward answer. We don't know the circumstances that led Marcy to distance herself from Ice King before the start of the series, and Marceline had her own mental well-being to consider. After all, one part of Betty Groff's character arc was trying her hardest to accept Ice King as he was, and exploding after she was incapable of that. You can't really blame Marceline for deciding to keep her life separate from Ice Kings and only monitoring him from afar. There's so much discussion to be had on that topic, and I'm not going to get into it here. But that is one of the reasons why the accusation of neglect by the Empress hits so hard. Because at some point in time, Marceline did make the choice to maintain a distance rather than trying to nurture Ice King's better nature. Welp, that's a bit of a downer to end the Empress discussion on, but we gotta keep on truckin'. It's time to discuss the Hierophant. May I come in? Nope. 
The Hierophant Arcanum is all about tradition. It's about orthodoxy, ritual, it's about conforming to the established system and rules. It's about following what is believed to be tried and true. Well then, I suppose I have no choice. I'm just going to waste you <gasps> and eat that kid because that's what an old school vampire does. And yeah, as you can obviously tell, the Hierophant in Stakes is a massive fan of all those things. He actively champions tradition and takes pride in his allegiance to the ways of old. Surely you agree that this is our chance to go back to our old ways. Surely diverging from the old ways is what made us vulnerable the first time. Old-fashioned ideas have no place here. Do what you like. I know what's right. This personality trait was taken to such an extreme that the Hierophant has a distaste for modernity in general. What is with all this tacky plastic rubbish? I can't even deal with all this modern nonsense. It's interesting that the vampire who wants the orthodoxy to remain unchanged is the one with the ability to transform. There is, however, a very fun visual constraint to the Hierophant's power. The animals he transforms into will still be wearing a pair of boots. Always with the boots. For the Hierophant, this is a self-imposed constraint. It's visual symbolism for the Hierophant being bound to his roots and unwilling to leave them behind. Oh jeez, that's not Schwabble, man. <laughs> well, you got me. What gave it away? The boots? And that aspect of never fully being able to leave your ideology behind, that's what makes the Hierophant so fun. All the ways in which his strict adherence to his ideals works against him. Honestly, I think that might be my favorite bit of visual symbolism out of the entire Stakes miniseries. A shortcoming often associated with a Hierophant card, especially when it comes up reversed, is following traditions or established rules without understanding the reasons for why they exist. This bullheadedness seems to be reflected in Hierophant's general outlook. He's not particularly interested in how things came to be what they are. The Demon Marceline staked us all. Why are we back? How did it happen? Listen. I don't know, and I don't care. We're alive, and I'm going to get eating. And the Hierophant strictly follows rules that have no tangible benefit to him. You can't come in unless I invite you in. <laughs> what do you think would even happen if you just walked in here, huh? You're so dumb, you sad old relic. May I remind you that the Empress barged into Ice King's home with zero issues and no repercussions. The Hierophant, on the other hand, is willing to die by his convictions. Fanatical adherence to the rules that govern his life is the very thing that causes his death. Religion is commonly associated with the Hierophant card, and this vampire zealously holds onto his beliefs as if they were sacrosanct. Blind devotion lacking in understanding can lead to some bad results, and traditions that don't adapt may die out. Jeez, what happened? Dude was too old-fashioned for his own good. He just couldn't get with the times. As for Marceline, her relationship to the Hierophant Arcanum is more subtle and more spread out throughout the miniseries. It relates to when the card comes up reversed. Marceline, unlike the Hierophant, is able to break away from the established norms she set for herself when the situation calls for it. Early on, Marceline makes the decision to fight the vampire solo, just as she did in the past, likely out of a sense of responsibility and wanting to protect her friends. Whoops. <coughs> oh no, my bum! <laughs> <laughs> hey guys, why don't y'all head back to the cabin? She feels the task is her burden alone to bear. After her pals save her butt, though... Yeah, you're welcome! she semi-begrudgingly accepts their help. <sighs> All right. I shouldn't have tried to go it alone with the vamps. From now on, we'll do this team-up style. <laughs> I'm gonna get you. Come on. See, Marcy, isn't vampire hunting better with friends? Yeah, I guess. 
which worked out for the best, because even their combined efforts left Marceline debilitated after fighting the Hierophant. I can't imagine Marcy could have succeeded alone. Huh? Yeah? Yeah. But the real struggle for Marceline came when the Vampire King pleads to break the cycle rather than fight and continue it. Marceline. Marcy is dead set on killing every single goddamn vampire. Take down the VK, kill him, destroy him, and kill him. Which is no different from how she was in the past. Would you wipe out an entire species? For the last time, yes! That is literally my entire plan! I especially like this exchange between Marceline and Finn. It's against my code to strike a foe who's raised their bottom to the sky. The Enchiridion explicitly states so. Demma your rules. Demma good rule though. Out of my way! The rules Marceline has been going by are not exactly unfounded. Compromising with most of the vampires would only lead to bad results. But ultimately, Marceline was able to step away from her nearly thousand-year-old conviction. Okay, ah! Dag! We'll take your stupid thing out! My what? Your dang vamp juice! Come on! Cool. <sighs> Knowing when to follow the rules you set for yourself and when to bend or change them is of vital importance in life. And I think Marceline's arc in stakes demonstrates that quite nicely. I've been talking about events related to the Vampire King, but it's not quite time for him yet. We first have to cover the moon. So how did the moon open a lock by shouting pigs at it over and over? We don't know. Nobody knows. That invokes the moon card's ties to confusion, mystery, and the unknown. And Sister Moon here is certainly the most inscrutable of all the vampires. We don't know any of her thoughts or motives, nor do we understand how her powers work. And we don't get to see her in any of Marceline's flashbacks. It appears Marcy was not very familiar with who the moon even was. <laughs> I picked up self-healing power last month, off some vamp with a head like a garden trowel. And during the events of Stakes, Marceline underestimates the danger the moon can pose to those who lack soul-sucking powers. Whoa, chill, Jake. These pearls were dropped by the moon. Her main power is accelerated healing. It'll be like fighting a cutting board. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, something tells me that's not how Finn and Jake will look back on their encounter with the moon. Finn. Ugh. Yes! Finn! She's dead! Oh, thank love. This vampire has a bunch of strange characteristics, with those glowing pearls she creates being one such example. The desiccated husks of the moon's victims end up stuffed with these orbs, and she seems to leave them behind like a deliberate trail to be followed, and perhaps these pearls might even be edible? Gross. I think they're pretty. What if they're like her boogers? Or worse. When it comes to the moon, who the hell knows? And something important to consider is, are you sure you want to find out? The uncanny mystique of the moon can be captivating, or sometimes even beautiful. But oftentimes, it's repulsive and frightening. That describes the vampire in stakes, but it is also an apt description of the tarot card. I think Adventure Time did an excellent job of capturing the peculiar energy and ambiance associated with the Moon Arcanum. Much of what the Moon card represents is what the vampire makes people around her feel, which includes fear, anxiety, delusion, disorientation, bewilderment, and other such similar conditions and emotions. Even when the moon is asleep, misunderstandings seem to sprout around her. Finn and Jake spend the whole day staking her back rather than taking her back. Man, we've been doing this for hours. You know, it's weird that PB wanted us to stake her back instead of us taking her back. Wait, taking or staking? That's a comical miscommunication that served as great joke material, but I got the impression that merely being in the moon's presence makes you subject to a mild delirium. Finn and Jake can certainly be pretty dumb. Whoa, I don't think so, man. 
I think you might have a hubris. But I'm of the opinion that this particular blunder was caused in part due to the moon's passive influence. I think the moon's defense mechanism while she sleeps during the day is mentally discombobulating people who wander into her general vicinity. Finding a way to permanently kill somebody with ridiculously powerful regeneration capabilities might be pretty hard when you're operating on only two brain cells. And once the sun goes down and the moon wakes, things get only more intense. Finn and Jake get plenty to fear and be bewildered by, not only from the moon's fluctuating appearance and creepy actions, but even her vague and bizarre dialogue. You run in the path of my light. How can you lead me when I am your guide? Are you being literal or allegorical? Upon trying to fight the moon, Finn and Jake's bodies give out on them in a manner I found quite reminiscent of certain types of severe anxiety attacks. Dread and disassociation mixed with mental and physical paralysis from this debilitating psychic cocktail that Jake describes as I feel like I'm in a slow motion terror dream! That is spot on for reflecting the negative qualities associated with the moon tarot card. The moon actually also ties into dreams, but more on that in a moment. Before that, I want to discuss the art on the classic moon tarot card and inspirations that may have sprung from it. First, the dog and wolf. These are thought to represent two halves of human nature, the dog signifying the civilized and domesticated, while the wolf signifies the wild and the feral. This duplicity is well reflected in the moon's behavior. She has a tame persona that at first glance may appear like a pushover. It'll be like fighting a cutting board. But conversely, she can flip into an intimidating feral persona. <laughs> Me no like! The duality in the moon's demeanor seems totally inspired by the symbolism behind the two canines featured on the card. Next, the crayfish emerging from a pond, the murky depths of which are thought to signify the primordial and the unknown. There's some major vibes to the episode You Forgot Your Floaties there. I wouldn't be surprised if the Simon Coconut Crab symbolism happened to be directly inspired by the Moon Tarot card. But that's a bit of a tangent, let's get back to the Stakes miniseries. After splitting from the Vampire King, the moon decides to take up residence on the edge of a body of water, and I severely doubt that this was a coincidental creative choice. There also happens to be a box of fresh lobsters in Peppermint Butler's Poison Lab, where the moon meets her demise, and whether that detail is merely coincidence or a deliberate reference, I don't even know anymore. Lastly, the card art has a path eliminated by moonlight, and if you recall the moon's dialogue, the influence there should be self-explanatory. But she said I'm running in her light! Who gives a dog? Just go! The winding pathway on the card art harks to the intermingling that occurs between the conscious and the unconscious mind, and this is where we segue to Marceline. For nearly the entire duration of the episode Take Her Back, Marceline is suffering from the effects of the Hierophant's Venom. And by the way, if that sounds like it could be an allegorical representation of the struggle associated with trying to shed the old you, that's because it totally is. So the literal, yet also symbolic Venom puts Marceline into a comatose state where she experienced fever dreams which brilliantly reflect the Moon Arcanum. My dreams are weird. All dreams are weird. But mom, my dreams are weird. The moon card is heavily tied to the subconscious realm and is associated with dreams, visions, illusions, and the imagination. It can pertain to creative blocks, repressed emotions, and inner turmoils. Marceline's dreams and stakes explore her desires and her uncertainties about the choice to become mortal. There's a lot to unpack in Marcy's dreams, they're very interesting and very personal, but I won't be doing that here in this video, because I already have a video focused on that very subject from many years ago. So if you want more analysis on Marceline's dreams, I urge you to go check that video out, because right now it's time to finally discuss none other than... The Vampire King. I'm dying to see him in person. I probably will die if I see him in person. <gasps> oh, jeez. 
It's the worst of them all. The Vampire King. Unlike the rest of the Vamp Entourage, the Vampire King is not named after any of the tarot cards, but he does name drop the two arcana he is associated with during the magnificent rousing speech that convinced Marceline not to stake him. For turning you would subjugate me to the wheel of fortune, and I am a king, not a hamster. My path runs straight into the void on a sick, flaming chariot! The Wheel of Fortune and the Chariot are the cards that epitomize the Vampire King. Both of these classic tarot card designs feature a sphinx. Whereas a sphinx generally has the body of a lion and the head of a human, the Vampire King's design is reversed. Lion face, humanoid torso. The VK's hairstyle slash mane seems to be stylized after the headdress adorned by the Great Sphinx of Giza, which is of course what the sphinxes on the classic tarot card art were based on. And since the Wheel of Fortune is the real cornucopia of visual inspiration when it comes to the Vampire King's design, let's spin off in that direction. Besides the lion and human components, which the Sphinx is already a combination of, the Vampire King's bird legs may have been pulled from the eagle in the upper right corner, and he has these scaly reptilian-esque forearms and hands. That idea may have been pulled from the presence of a snake on the card art. The VK has no bovine components to his design, but he did develop quite a fondness for this cow that he even ended up taking into the devamping machine with him towards the end of the miniseries. As for Anubis, well, he's got a fat butt, and the VK's got a fat butt. What happened to your pants? Jokes aside, the VK does seem to make an indirect reference to Anubis. You weigh the scales of fate. Which is pretty neat. I think it's safe to say that the art on the Wheel of Fortune card greatly inspired the eventual design of the Vampire King, especially when you consider that his early concept art lacked all of these interesting components. And may I just say, I love how the Vampire King's final design turned out. It is among my all-time favorites of the whole show. With those visual connections behind us, let's now move on to the meaning. In Stakes, the Vampire King's ideology is based around his perceived subjugation to the Wheel of Fortune and his desire to break free from its influence. Free me from the shackles of my station. The Vampire King wants to defy destiny, but paradoxically, the more he attempts to reject the Wheel of Fortune, the more he personifies it. Heck, from Marceline's perspective by the end of the miniseries, he kind of became the harbinger of it. Even the VK's awareness of the arcana that his life is linked with only serves to strengthen his ties to the Wheel of Fortune, because this card prompts one to look at the bigger picture and have a wider perspective. As the card's name implies, it relates to the cyclical nature of existence and how the passage of time can bring about both good change and bad change. This arcanum often signifies turning points in a person's life, or twists of fate, if you will. The Vampire King is all about ushering in these sorts of turning points. He tries to seek alternate paths into the future that break convention. Even in the past, rather than defeating Marceline, which was within his capability, he made the rather bizarre choice to sacrifice himself so that he could turn Marceline into a vampire. I imagine because he thought it would shake things up while still serving to preserve vampire kind. You know, Marceline, there's still another way. Give it a rest already! No, another, another way. After reforming from the nebulous goop that was extracted from Marceline's body, the Vampire King sought coexistence and compromise with Marceline. I've changed as well. I only eat animals now, just like everyone else. Ugh. But then while Marcy was off on her kill spree, the Vampire King pondered the nature of existence and basically decided he didn't want any. This is the old way. Agents of darkness and light in a tug of war. But now, a creature can step out of that struggle. In this age, why would I want to be the Vampire King anymore? The VK decided to reject vampirism at its source. He wanted to enter a new form of existence. That sort of gave me some mild Martin Mertens vibes, actually. I'm just giving you the choice of a new mode of existence. Hey, how about I get a new mode? 
I never thought I would be comparing the Vampire King to Finn's dad of all people, but as the fates would have it, that low-key similarity does exist, and it's rather intriguing. Since the Wheel of Fortune card conveys fluctuations, it often deals with transitional states and connotes opposites and reversals. There's a lot of that going on in stakes, both for the Vampire King and Marceline the Vampire Queen, who I will be regularly weaving in and out of the Wheel of Fortune discussion because as the VK said, Our lives are magnetized. So just to summarize, Marceline went from a mortal non-vampire to an immortal vampire at the same time the Vampire King went from being alive to being dead, and when Marceline underwent a reversal back to the mortal realm, it led to the resurrection of the VK, but after the Vampire King phase shifted into the mortal realm himself, Marceline ended up returning to being the immortal Vampire Queen, which apparently also manifested remnants of the Vampire King as we knew him before he devamped. Although, side note, it's interesting that the VK bestowed Marcy with the title of Vampire Queen, even when she was still planning to remain in her mortal state. Queen of Vampires! Even Bonnabelle Bubblegum got in on that reversal action. So, once I usurp Crunchy, I'll have my castle back again. The Vampire King might also say there was a reversal in his relationship with Marcy, going from enemies to friends. Does that mean we can be friends now, Marceline? Although I doubt Marceline will ever perceive it that way. Speaking of perception, the Wheel of Fortune card calls for seeing how life's threads weave together, which allows one to uncover patterns and cycles, which denote loops of the figurative wheel in a sense. This aspect of the card would be massively amplified when discussing characters that have lived for longer than humans are capable of, such as thousand-year-old Marceline, and we don't know how old the Vampire King is, but he certainly carries himself like he's fairly ancient. He is the one who asks for Marcy to reflect on the nature of existence, and she comes to the exact same conclusion that he did, as he suspected. What's the one thing you've noticed about the world since you beat me all those hundreds of years ago? Everything repeats over and over again. No one learns anything, because no one lives long enough to see the pattern, I guess. The world is always changing, but in many ways it keeps on repeating and staying the same. Cue the lyrics to Everything Stays, which evokes the Wheel of Fortune very well. Despite Marceline having lived long enough to see these repeating patterns, she still can't escape the fate of the wheel. Marcy begins stakes as a vampire, and she ends stakes as a vampire. Be that as it may, as Marcy clumsily stated herself, the experience still allowed for her to grow as a person. Now I'm a vampire with fresh mortal memories and, I don't know, more empathy or something? More grown up. Bonnie, thank you for helping me grow up. Now I guess we get to hang out together forever. The Wheel of Fortune certainly spun in Marcy's favor when it comes to her course with Bonnie. I must look a real mess. Nah, you always look great after fighting a monster. You think so? <laughs> Adaptability is what allows one to find balance when the world around them keeps on spinning, and adaptability is favored by the Wheel of Fortune. The Vampire King, however, does not want to adapt. The Vampire King wants to overcome. And this is where we transition to the Chariot Arcanum. If the Wheel of Fortune is behind the Vampire King's motivations, then the Chariot drives his behavior. The Chariot stands for victory and dominance. It's all about willpower and determination. It often represents overcoming obstacles through dedication and grit. It's all about asserting yourself to get what you want. I come to you! Channeling the Chariot card gives you the ability to get kicked in the nards 11 times and still retain your composure. It's chill. See? No funny business. I want to draw attention to the very first action we, as the audience, see the Vampire King perform. The first impression from this was quite bizarre, but it actually ingeniously portrays both the Chariot and the Wheel of Fortune attributes of the VK's character. After resurrecting, the Fool was bewildered by the return of his missing tooth. Also, I used to be dead. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> 
So the Vampire King performed a kiss with such intense suction that it removed that tooth from the fool's mouth. <laughs> Incoming tangent, I can't help but drop some trash talk about how it took until the series finale for Marceline and Princess Bubblegum to finally kiss, and even then an angle was chosen where their faces were obfuscated for most of it. That being said, I do really like this shot, as well as the meta metaphor about how their kiss is earth-shaking. But anyway, I just think it's funny how the Vampire King was allowed to perform the most intense hickey imaginable while in the middle of a French kiss to someone's teeth. I'm imagining it like, hey, Cartoon Network got back to us. We can have our characters French kiss so hard that teeth are slipping out of gums, as long as it's not gay. Okay, so after the VK acts like a fucking weirdo with no concept of personal boundaries, he says, Fool, this is life. Get a hot dog if you can't take the bun. Which essentially translates to, if life is not to your liking, then spice it up. If things are too bland, slip in the meat. Hmm, that came out sounding rather awkward. By the way, the kiss harks back to the Wheel of Fortune, because the Vampire King, on a spontaneous whim, returned the fool back to the state he was in around the time he died. It was a reversal of fortune at the Vampire King's behest, and in a way it was foreshadowing to Marcy killing the fool again later in the episode. I should also point out the symbolic nature of the kiss, in that it denotes the Vampire King taking on the Fool's essence. The VK takes what the Fool represents onto himself via that kiss. Specifically, I am talking about how the Fool represents a new phase or journey. This is the symbolic starting point of the Vampire King's adventure, in a sense. Does anyone have any milk for this? You might be thinking, okay, but why did the VK kiss the Fool literally? I'm guessing that the Vampire King's intent was akin to slapping someone who's acting hysterical. The goal is to reset the person, so to say, and have them get with the program. However, the fool was just being a goof. He did not seem particularly perturbed or bothered by the developments, just puzzled and surprised. So the VK's kiss comes off as very out of line and disconcerting. And this is where we broaden our perspective to discuss the Chariot's association with control. The Vampire King's wish is to exist on his terms, so he asserts his control on the things around him. What the Vampire King realizes over the course of stakes is that his inner desire is actually mastery of the self. By the way, the VK kinda sorta attains that goal in an abstract and fragmented way by giving up higher consciousness, which... That's an endless pit of analysis that I do not have time to go spelunking in right now, but I wanted to mention it because it's provocative. Anyway, the point at hand is that the Vampire King is all about control. Even his powers are about control. His telekinesis is him exerting his control over physical objects. His teleportation is bending space to his will so that he can manifest where he pleases. And the dude is even able to create barriers that block out the sun. When it comes to behavior, though, many of the negative qualities associated with a chariot card come from trying to assert your control over other people. This can take a variety of forms. Being overly aggressive is surely one of them. Surely? Surely? Surely, Jay Temple! or assuming you know what's best for others, or disregarding the desires of others completely, and one big potential flaw that could emerge with a chariot going full steam ahead is that attempts to assert control over others can lead to a breach of consent. The reason the Vampire King sucks out the Fool's tooth is because he does not care about the Fool's consent. The VK does not care about the consent of the cow. No to which he forms an affection for. Uh, uh, I don't like to dance. I'm a wallflower. <laughs> and in what I consider to be one of the best, yet most disturbing scenes out of the entire Stakes miniseries, the Vampire King does not care about Marceline's consent and turns her into a vampire against her will. This is a moment of violation, and the visual allegory is by design, and the scene is legitimately hard to watch. While the Vampire King admits he was evil and wants to change, he was still evil. 
He only turned a new leaf after his resurrection, so no amount of conviction would be enough for Marceline. You've done enough already to get staked a thousand times over. You're monsters. There is a limit to how far the chariot can take you. There is a time, place, and proper circumstances for making things you want happen through the power of your will, and if you try to personify attributes of the chariot card beyond the proper framework to do so effectively, what once may have seemed awe-inspiring can instead make you look like a gibbering man-baby. The Vampire King's speech was indeed amazing for a while, but let's not forget that as it kept going, it turned into the VK splashing around in a puddle in his undies while cursing Marcy. He was throwing a tantrum. Do I have to spell out the visual symbolism there? He's a piss baby. Do it, chicken. You make me sick. <laughs> When the veil of perceived control crumbles, sometimes what's underneath is... an idiot. <sighs> By the way, this was not the first occasion in Adventure Time where attempts to control others and the sidelining of consent debased a character into appearing like a giant man-baby. But, but it was important because the Cosmic Owl was- Oh, wah wah. 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 Oh, wah. Hey, look at that! I had previously compared the Vampire King to Finn's dad, and now I'm throwing Finn under the bus with him too! Bang! Have some of these bangers, why don't ya? Bang! Now, Finn was a baby back in Frost and Fire because he was behaving like a varmint, but the Vampire King was a baby because he was having a hard time trying to stop being a varmint. The VK's character arc in stakes is one that does steer him away from being an evil jerk. The VK does want Marceline's agreement, he asks for her cooperation, he attempts to be courteous and considerate to Marcy and her friends, even when fending off their attempts to kill him. And while the Vampire King still asserts himself, he does so without violence. Let me finish my thought. Stick you! Okay, go ahead. Apparently, the Grass Sword couldn't sense genuine hostility or danger from the VK, despite the VK clearly feeling genuine annoyance. Mm. I think that's a good indicator that the Vampire King was legitimately trying his best to change, and was also succeeding at restraining his emotions. The Vampire King does manage to quell his baser instincts and urges in his quest to break the cycle. My thirst for blood is an awesome force. But in these new times, I have a chance to try a different course. I think I wanna... But ultimately, all of those things were merely prerequisites for the Vampire King to actually get his way for him to finally convince Marcy to change her mind, the Vampire King had to give up his control. There was not much humility in the action, but the VK did place his life into Marceline's hands. Queen of Vampires, you weigh the scales of fate, spill my guts, or face the unknown. Either way, I will not bite. Giving Marceline complete and utter control over his destiny is what convinced the Vampire Queen to spare the Vampire King. If the VK is indeed on a path straight into the void on a sick, flaming chariot, then Marceline is the one driving that chariot. Hold on, that's actually way more literal than I first thought when you consider the psychic remnants of the VK in Marcy's mind at the end of stakes? Huh. Looking back, it's rather funny, when I started making a guide for this video, like, five years ago, I thought the chariot would be one of the more boring associations. Turns out, there's like an entire robust deconstruction of the chariot arcanum in the Vampire King's character arc, and it was just another thing to remind me that Adventure Time is a flippin' amazing piece of literature. <laughs> Come on, Finn! Let me hear that war cry! <laughs> We're not done with the chariot card quite yet, though, because Marcy had a big pivotal moment in stakes where her metaphorical chariot basically broke down. With the vampire essence released, and the Wheel of Fortune continuing to spin as it always has, Marcy succumbed to dejection and gave up. That's it. I'm done. 
what happens in Marceline's mind in the aftermath of the Vampire Essence explosion is very well represented by a sudden reversal of the Chariot card. The emergence of the Dark Cloud for Marcy was like having all the positive energy associated with the Chariot stripped away in an instant. All the focus and tenacity is replaced with a total loss of drive, a loss of self-confidence, a sudden lack of any tangible goals, and the crushing feeling of futility and self-pity. Marcy breaks down because she feels like she not only lost all control, but that she never had any control. She feels like none of her actions have ever led to outcomes she's happy with. Marcy fell into the pit of thinking everything she does just further fucks up her life. And geez, Louise, trying to fix it? Trying to fix me? Just made things a thousand times worse. So why even try, you know? What's the point? Her self-deception is easy to see through for us as the audience. We're well aware of how Marcy's interplay with history literally allowed for Finn the Human to be born, among countless other things. And I think we can all agree that Adventure Time is better with Marceline in it. But Marceline is drowning in the reductive depths of despondency, and seeing value in anything under such a mental state can be extremely difficult. Was it reality? You remembered my song! <laughs> the Chariot card is all about individuality, but when reversed, it can be a reminder that in hard times, you might need a helping hand, a gentle nudge that you can reorient yourself with. It can be as simple as hearing the right words at the right time to propel you back to your former glory. You and me, we're survivors, right? Like cockroaches or rats. That's the look. That's the look of someone whose mental framework just got rearranged. I adore how it's Ice King who delivered the exact wake-up call that Marceline needed. He calls Marceline a rat and a cockroach, but from a place of acceptance and love. He has zero judgment of Marcy, he is holding no disappointment, he is holding no pity. Ice King's words are from a place of pure solidarity, and this is why they have such a profound effect. Better to run and hide like a rat, right buddy? Mm. Did you just call me a cockroach, Simon? What? No! No, 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 no. Thanks, buddy. Simon's words are able to flip Marceline's entire perspective around which allows her to flip the chariot back into the upright position, and that allows Marceline to come to terms with and accept the Wheel of Fortune. I don't want to say, like, I'm sorry about who you are or anything if you're feeling okay, but I don't know how bad news all this is, right? Nah, I'm cool being a vampire again. And this is where I'm going to shift my framework of analysis, ever so slightly, for the final section of this video. In a reversal of how the vampires up till now have had associations with tarot cards, for the concluding discussion, I want to assign Marceline the Vampire Queen with a tarot card that I feel best represents her. I want to pick out a tarot card that reflects Marceline's adventure and stakes, but also the collective journey of her entire life. Technically, I already gave it away in the introduction, and I'm sure most of you have probably picked out the specific card I have in mind already, but I'm still gonna build some suspense for the final vampire. Vampire King? You still in here? Hello? Too bad. In the middle of all the action, this dialogue from Marcy may sound a little like a badass one-liner, and it very much is in some ways, especially given the tone of Marcy's determined voice, and even more so if you remove the scene from its larger context. What one might overlook regarding this line of dialogue, however, are the gentle and compassionate undertones beneath. I've basically just described the Strength Tarot card. Marceline represents strength. Unlike the Chariot, the Strength Arcanum is not about being physically powerful and winning battles. Ugh, I'm gonna poop my pants if Finn kills this guy instead of me! Although, at times it can be, if that battle is emblematic of an internal personal fight that's waging inside you and conquering some big ol' monster is symbolic for self-actualization, or something. What I'm saying is, this card is about inner strength. It represents having the ability to endure and bounce back from setbacks. It's about overcoming obstacles with compassion and understanding. 
Benevolence and magnanimity are attributes that are often characterized by this card, and one fun way to think about it is, strength is holding yourself to the personal standard of not being a cockroach. While the Dark Cloud was a menace that was wreaking uncontrolled havoc on the Land of U and had to be defeated, instead of going straight to vanquishing it, Marceline shows her sympathy. Vampire King, you still in here? Hello? Remember, Marceline bears intense hatred toward the Vampire King and was dead set on exterminating him from the face of the planet until just recently, and yet she still tries to find the BK's presence in the Dark Cloud in case there's a chance that she doesn't have to kill him again. Too bad. Strength is doing what has to be done, but out of love and care for others, and with love and care for others. By the way, Marcy defeats the Dark Cloud by sucking it up from within by awakening a mouth that rests within her own body. That's a stacked visual metaphor for inner strength. I think it's no coincidence that the Strength Tarot card depicts a woman nonviolently subduing a lion. This is yet another example of the visual imagery and stakes being derived from art on the traditional tarot cards. Speaking of, the Lemniscate, or infinity symbol, above the woman's head has been thought to represent a wide variety of things, but in the context of stakes, it's hard not to think of Marceline's immortality. Historically, the strength card used to be called Fortitude because, as already discussed, it's about persisting through dark times. Stakes had Marceline at some of the lowest moments in her life, and the miniseries was about Marcy finding the strength to soldier on through her immortal existence. Marceline the Vampire Queen has had a rough life. Marcy felt like a monster before she was ever a vampire due to being half-demon. It limited her ability to form relationships with others in a time when the world was laid to waste. As a child, Marcy was abandoned by her biological father, lost her mother in the aftermath of the apocalypse, she ended up being abandoned by her father figure, and then was let down by her dad yet again. Marcy spent much of her life as a teenager by her lonesome, trying to find friends while saving humans who merely feared her in return. And when Marcy finally found a loving community, she had to abandon them after being turned into a vampire. And that's when Marceline's immortal life began, followed by hundreds of years of existential depression, vampiric urges, and the gnawing feeling that Marcy sabotaged every meaningful relationship she's ever had. Marceline often feels like life is a big fart. Yeah, girl, it Marceline's songs have also suggested that the toll of being immortal is wearing away at her psyche and sense of self-identity. The thought of having to live forever to continue existing indefinitely into the future, as the world keeps on going through cycles of destruction outside your control, that's low-key horrific. It sounds like it could be an existential nightmare. Maybe that's just my depression talking, but compound that with a potential loss of self due to your collection of memories putrefying in your head for eons? Yeesh. I could have snapped and done you all in at any time. <laughs> Who knows how much truth is in Marceline's joke? While she puts on a front like usual, this is a legitimate fear that she grapples with. Marcy is afraid of losing control over her vampirism and hurting innocent people. I mean, she even has dreams where her fangs gain their own autonomy. But despite being a cave hag who dwells in the pits of self-hate and futility for most of Adventure Time, Marceline has always continued to persevere as a force of good in the land of Ooh, even if she sometimes did lose track of her moral code. Marceline has always embodied strength, even if she sometimes forgets that fact. Stakes was a sort of reboot for Marcy, where facing the past allowed her to reorient her perspective, find her inner strength, and acquire newfound control over her powers. The trials and tribulations that Marcy overcame in Stakes allowed for her to come to terms with who she is as a person, what she wants out of life, and they also gave her the power to channel the Dark Cloud in the series finale to protect the person she holds most dear. The purpose of strength is protecting your loved ones, after all. Despite all the hardship and the ephemeral nature of time, life can still be beautiful. Marcy put a lot of work into this meat reality, and she'd like to see it through. 
We were messed up kids who taught ourselves how to live And I'm still scared that I'm not good enough You're the pink in my cheeks and I love that it means I'm a little bit soft Hey, you've made it to the end of my tarot-based analysis. I hope you've enjoyed my exploration of the Stakes miniseries, and I hope it provided you with food for thought. If you want to share any of those ideas or opinions in the comments, I'd be delighted. This video had been lodged in the production backburner for about five years, and more recently, I've hit tons of delays and difficulties, both technical and otherwise, that ended up pushing this video far beyond Obsidian's release date. But in retrospect, it was quite fortunate that I left this video concept to ferment for so long, because steaks aged like fine wine. Thank you for watching, and thanks to all the people who support this channel on Patreon. Rest assured, there will be plenty more Adventure Time videos into the far distant future.